and I'd like to introduce Phoebe Whitman, Paul Fjord, Fleur Watson, and Simone Leamon. Tonight, they're going to introduce the fabulous Troika, and to do that, I'm going to hand over to Fleur Watson. Thank you. Well, tonight we're talking to Troika, and Troika are Eva Ruki, Connie Fryer, and Sebastian Knoll. Together, they have pioneered a technology-infused design movement and are highly regarded for their experimental projects that merge art, architecture, and technical invention. Troika represent a new wave of progressive design practice not bound by discipline. They create unforgettable objects, installations and printed matters that are playful, intelligent and contemplative. And if you bear with me, I'd just like to read you this quote. Um, it's from uh, the Professor and Head of Department of History of Design at the Royal College of Art, David Crowley, and I think it really captures something quite special. Working in the space between art, design and technology, Troika have an unusual, unusual awareness of the past. Their designs frequently draw on the reserves of knowledge, which can be found in seemingly redundant technologies and overlooked materials. Cloud, for example, draws on the flip dock systems, which used to serve information display boards at airports and railway stations. But of course, this is updated too. The displays used to update every 30 seconds, and now they flip in real time. So I'd like that to start that as a discussion point and, and to welcome Connie and Sebastian to um, this talk. And they're here in their London studio, standing in front of a very beautiful recycled railway brick wall. So welcome to you both. Um, Thank you. Welcome. And perhaps, if I can, I might just start um, with a question to you, Sebastian, to kick off. And, and Connie, um, feel free to interject at any time. We, we just talked a little bit about how your work sits at the junction of art, architecture and technical invention and where they intersect. Can you describe this a little bit further and how it informs your work? Well, I, I guess you, you have a... Can you hear me properly? Yes, well. Okay. Good. Uh, well, first, thank you for inviting you us uh, to talk today. Um, it's quite quite spooky for us to make this kind of interview. Because we can't see anybody on, uh, from the crowd, so I don't know how many you are or uh, if you're going to laugh at the stupid joke I'm making. But They're laughing. to answer your question, I think... Um, you, you have to put it more like a, in a, an historical perspective, if I may say, even if the, the company, our studio is only like 10 years old. Um, art, in a, in a way, was like both an inspiration and aspiration of what we wanted to do. Uh, but also, from the very early beginning, there was like the kind of uh, context in, in which the work that we were producing was read. Uh, so in a way, we, well, we no, nobody has ever, ever come to us for a kind of design brief, apart from very, very few exceptions, um, the, the V&A sign that we made being one. Um, so I think like uh, the, the, the art part is like uh, the, the natural, you know, the natural place where we found ourselves. Uh, the architecture is uh, more representing like an aspiration we had from um, making work slightly outside the, the gallery context because you have. Um, then you have to work with a real context. It's not a blank canvas. It's not like a, a place where, um, it, which is devoid of historicality or, uh, you know, like he has a meaning because it's in, embedded in our everyday life. And that was quite uh, interesting for us. Um, I guess also like another aspect which was uh, in, interesting for us in, in the term architecture is the scale because it's uh, very often uh, putting us to large scale thing. Now the technology element is more a kind of a, the medium of choice, if you want. Like a, you know, people people paint with oil. We do things with technology because we kind of um, are fascinated by the possibilities it's opening up in terms of aesthetic experience, in terms of um, you know, like a relationship with the context, with the people, etc. But also as a as a signifier of our times. Um, we live in highly technological times, so it's, I think it's quite interesting to subvert the medium by using it um, in, in the pieces themselves. So I guess we have like a very, um, a very cross-fertilized, uh, you know, like field which is at the merger of all those different practices. Um, 
which also makes me, when, when you ask that question, makes me think about uh, the, the classical distinction that people do between art and design, and should there be one? I rephrase that thing is, uh, when you have like a designer that are out authoring their work, where they are, you know, like the generator of the work itself, how different is that from practice of a fine artist? And vice versa, if you have like fine artists that suddenly are interested in escaping the gallery system or that are interested in, for example, uh, relational aesthetic, um, don't they try to become designers? Sebastian, so think, uh, one thing, um, if I can just interject for a minute, one thing just you said a little yeah, bit earlier, which would be nice to touch on, is you said nobody ever came to you with a design brief apart from that one project. That's really yeah. interesting. So as a practice, how did you work with that? If the work wasn't coming to you in terms of a traditional design brief, was it a situation where you created your own design briefs and experimented um, with ideas that then you put out there? Yeah, Can absolutely. But you also have, um, I mean, the, 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 the final work is not so different. I mean, like if you do, like for example, commission in public art, people come not with a brief, they come with a context. So no, no, like uh, what what you do is uh, is not uh, scripted, or the intervention is not scripted, but the context is. So in a way, the context becomes the brief. Sebastian, it's Simone speaking. Um, that leads quite nicely to a question that I had for you, and that is, when we are working in contexts such as the gallery, and then uh, we work with clients, we work in the public space, we we, we have these um, practices that take on many sort of faces. How, I guess my question to, to you and to Troika is, how do you sustain that side of your practice where you are initiating the projects yourself and whether they end up in the gallery or in more experimental um, contexts, what is the nature of the, of the business that underpins those projects? Can you can you explain for our audience? I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure what's the question what the question is really. Well, maybe um, I can try to. So that, did, did you so understand that, it? Okay. So yeah, I, no, I, I guess do, I the do. question is, uh, if you are self-initiating your own projects, so yeah. if you are doing projects where you do not have a client or a commissioner, um, yeah. I guess my question is. I assume that Troika does have um, or does participate in many projects where you yourselves are finding the reason, the context and the, uh, the ambition, if you like, for the work that you're doing. And my question is, if you pursue that type of activity, how do you sustain it within a studio practice with, uh, with people who work for you and a network of people that you work with? Lots of work, going home at 12 o'clock in the morning. No, it's basically, it's basically, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite pragmatic where um, it's the three of us and we really try to make uh, room and space to constantly reevaluate what it is we're doing, to free the time to actually discuss with one another what is it that inspires us, and then really on a pragmatic level to, to free uh, time to experiment and this is what is the center of our practice and it's the most important part and this kind of exchange and these experiments feed into then commissioned works and sometimes not commissioned works if we're approached for let's say an exhibition then we're going to exhibit it in this kind of context but it's really um, yeah I guess the, the biggest challenge is to, to free that time and always to step back from your own work and to look from from far from afar and 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 assessing the, the reason why you're doing it and also assessing how people perceive your work and how you would like to perceive them your work or what is your message what is your f philosophy Connie that's really I guess, it, sorry I please, guess just continue. to add to, to Connie it's uh, if you want to go down to the really boring pragmatic level, um, 
the more you do it, the more people know about what you do and the more they come to you to ask you to do something as simple as that. So um, how do you find the work? You don't really find the work. The work finds you. Connie and, and Sebastian, I think it's really interesting that idea of reflection and the importance of, of creating time within your your work and your studio to um, obviously invest in ideas that are not necessarily always about a commission, they're more about research. And, and I guess that brings me to the subject of publishing and writing about your work and um, your book, Digital Design. And it seems like that that is a very um, generous type of publication, that really you're looking at um, not necessarily only defining a moment in time, but looking at yourself in context of many other practices. Can you talk a little bit about how the book happened and, and what your intent for the book was? Mm -hmm. um, well, basically, the when we started or when we had the idea for for making the book the intention was um came from a from a very specific corner which was basically the three of us creating work uh, in collaboration sometimes with other people and we found that it was a very interesting space to be in but at the same time also a space that was um, not very uh, obvious to an audience or to many people around us because it was merging very, very different disciplines, very, very different ways of thinking and also um, using technology, the output is something that is often moving and often experiential. So looking around at that time, uh, there was very little uh, coverage on, on how do you actually uh, present this work, either in, in a written format, in a visual format. Uh, and back at that time, you would find the occasional blog entry with um, some kind of description of what was going on. And we really felt that um, we wanted to um, a understand our own context, like what other people are working or doing similar kind of work, but also understanding the, the critical discourse within it and finding a tool or a platform to to tie that all together and 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 deliver. That idea of critical discourse is, is a really interesting one in design, isn't it? Because I guess it's so embedded within art as, as a discipline and also within architecture, but perhaps within design it's a fairly, it's a fairly new area of discourse. Do you, do you agree or is that something that you think is, is there and not necessarily needs to be drawn out of stage. No, absolutely. I, I mean, this is like something that is uh, lacking in everything, starting from the educational context, you know, like if you are like in art school, you would debate uh, the work, you would put the work in context, you would put to the work in, to an historical perspective, you would critically analyze what you're doing. In design, it's slightly different, although it's changing very, very rapidly, and I'm very glad about that. But you have a, um, the, the importance on, on, on those kind of more theoretical or more academical understanding of the work is, is, not, is not present, not enforced, and uh, to a certain extent not encouraged, uh, since design is uh, a vocation to be a service primarily. So you don't need to reflect too much mm. if you want, um, which, which is a shame. Which is, I think, it could greatly benefit uh, both sides of, of the argument. Well, certainly, but your work is taking that. That was for that. So, but like, that's a, what motivated us to to write the book in, in, in the first place. It's like trying to um, gather in one volume a, a kind of contextual and critical understanding of the work that was done with new media. Is teaching important to you as part of that process? So you, do you invest in, in teaching yourselves? Yeah, yeah very much. Yeah, I, I personally teach at the, the Royal College of Art um, in the design department, which is uh, quite interesting. And uh, I lead like a small group which is called uh, Platform 13, uh, where we essentially invite uh, our students to look outside of design completely. 
So uh, not looking at a single self-referential chair or, or anything like that. Not because it's not interesting, but I think there's uh, a value in, in looking more broadly um, at, at design as, as an activity. So methodology, too. it's not uh, a, a, it's not a cert. I was just going to say, is that because a lot of your uh, work, I guess, has that sort of relationship with nature and that idea of repetition in nature so through a lot of your work, is that something that you, as at Troika, the big focus to look away from design, I guess, and look towards things like nature and our own environment to sort of, for inspiration? And... It's a part of it, yeah. Definitely. It's like the work, for example, if uh, uh, you're mentioning nature or natural like thing, there's like lots of ideas we found absolutely beautiful. Like uh, we did a piece in Toronto with, uh, um, which we cover like a ceiling with like about like 500 fish farms that are simply rotating on their own axis. Alone, they would be like meaningless and very, it's a very dumb system. If you start to multiply it by 500, you start to oh, enter like uh, behavior like a school of fishes or things like that, which are uh, algorithmically a fascinating structure. They're very simple and yet very uh, beautiful for the, uh, the pattern that emerges from those simple rules. Mm. But to, do, to discover that, we have to go and, uh, well, we will go and ask like scientists. We go and knock at the door of Natural History Museum and uh, go through all the, you know, talk with the researcher, what are they doing? And they, it's very fascinating. You can do it in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, um, I've, uh, I've been teaching today myself at, uh, at a university here in Melbourne in the design school, and we were looking at some of your work, some of the work of Troika, and um, I asked one of the students, could they talk about it, and they said, well, I can tell you how it makes me feel. And I've picked up too that, Connie, you've used the word experience a great deal in speaking about the, the, the work that uh, the Troika does. And so I guess a question that I have for you both is, can you talk about the emotional quality of the work that you do? And is designing in emotive responses something that you are quite knowingly or consciously try to do? Or is it um, an effect of the conversations that you have in the company of the work? I think that. It's a very interesting question. It's not designed in. Um, it's not something that we consciously design. I think it's a result of the work. Uh, but as I mentioned before, um, technology as a tool lends itself um, to yeah, interactive spaces, create these experiences. And I think what is more important to us is uh, the simplicity and the output of our work. Uh, if you look at the falling light, for instance, um, yeah, we were inspired by a natural phenomenon that is, is, is something very scientific, but also something that um, Sebastian, myself, and Eva uh, would experience while watching a rainbow. That's something very, uh, very visceral experience, very personal experience. Uh, so a, 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 a large personal part is into that. And then us using uh, technology as a tool and, and creating an installation with lots of little devices that project rain onto the floor um, is a reflection on, on technology, is a reflection on nature, and as a result, you enter that kind of space, uh, creates an experience for the audience, but it's not the starting point for the, for the work. But at the same time, you can take. I disagree. <laughs> That's good. You you can at the same time you can take a technology like electroluminescent uh, technology or EL, and you can do the most sophisticated or sublime uh, thing with it. I'm thinking of the uh, the world clock or the all the time in the world, the installation um, that you produce using the EL technology. Now, here in Australia, we're lucky if we see that technology at a sexy bus shelter or in a piece of advertising. So we rarely get to experience 
any expressive capacity that this technology has. Um, so I'm curious about, there are lots of different modalities of technology, so what draws you to the technology that you work with? Have you got an agent that goes out there and finds, or, or is it is it um, uh, rooted deeper in a conversation that you're having with technology? It's very difficult to trace which, which comes first, like uh, the chicken or the eggs. Uh, it's a mix. It's a mixture of both. You know, like it's uh, we constantly look at things, uh, and you know, um, things lying around. Like uh, I think, like e the real thing, we started like in 2003 because we we had a chance encounter with a guy that was making the technology, and he showed us the thing, and we didn't know what to do with it for for several years, and then we thought, ah, oh, brilliant, we can use it for for that. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's difficult to know. Where it comes from, you know, but, first. But it's but, also, but it's also, may I say that uh, we are surrounded by technology every day, and what we liked also with the um, electroluminescent technology that you were just referring to is Thanks. twisting uh, the conventional use of technologies. And this one was, as you said, you might see it printed on a bus shelter, or the original uh, use for it was actually in helicopter to landing pads and that's what they were used for so if anything we're encountered with in terms of technology we we'll always question uh, how can you actually uh, question the use how can you use it differently and um, also the the origin of this this clock was a question of why um, if you go to airports, do you have hundreds of uh, four-color display screens um, if you only display two-color information? So what, what technology might lend itself better uh, for this kind of display of information? So it's, it's feeding from many different sources. And also we were fascinated by the fact that it's a screen printing technology, something very, very simple and basic, where you print several layers uh, of ink, copper, phosphor, uh, and then you send an electric current through it and it lights up. Very, very basic uh, um, tactile. But this is the materiality. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you look at the air, there's a, it's a very strange material. It's completely flat. It glows completely uniformly. It's a, it's a kind of a technological uh, um, perfection, you know, in, in that. It's like super cold. And, uh, and it's quite interesting to, to work uh, like a medium that have that kind of very, very strong characteristic in the first place. So it seems often in your work that there is a real kind of unravelling of technology, perhaps even looking at the history and, and the origins of it. And I know um, before we, we uh, started tonight, we had a little test and, and uh, Connie did a little spin around the studio and we, we could see you all working away there, but we also saw that you have quite a large model making area. So. It, technology at one end is obviously very important in your work, but how important is making and testing within your work within the studio? Is that something that you do as part of the process to try and understand these technologies, whether they're past or present? Do you, do you kind of work on a, on a much more low-tech way of modelling first and then, and then kind of scale it up? How does that work? Very much so. We, we, we start, we make like countless prototypes for every, every installation that you've seen. If you look around the studio, you have like things that start with one flip dot, two flip dot, ten flip dot, three hundred flip dot, and so on and so forth. And it's, uh, yeah, like being hands on is very important. It's like, a, to me, it's, it's a bit like fine art, you know, like you, you have to, to play with the medium to be able to understand how it behaves, how it makes you feel, how... Because, yeah, like, you know, it goes back a little bit to, to the question that you were saying before, but do we design in the emotional impact of the work? And I say that disagreed with Pony, uh, because we do. We do, we, do, we do design in, it's a result of the process. You know, if you see, like, this beautiful, flat, glacial light, 
uh, of the electron emission print, you're gonna you gonna construct the whole experience from those build blocks, and uh, it's not something that is very. I had a teacher who was telling me uh, all the time, if art is a language, you should not talk about it. Because if you talk about it, you translate, and if you translate, you lose. And uh, and I think like that's a very uh, beautiful way of ex explaining that kind of, of processes. So all like the, the viscerality and the poetry that you can feel in the uh, end piece, I think very very much so is part of that prototyping process of, of like true. playing true. with the material, of seeing how it behaves, of of taking the thing and saying, okay, what happens if I put it like that, or what happens if we start cutting it this way? Or, and it's an experience you can only as a people of the meeting. So in that intent and this disagreement slightly between the two of you, which is nice to see, healthy, um, if there is an intent um, about creating this emotional experience and a, and a kind of visceral um, response, it, is there a kind of greater cultural message within the, the work as it builds to a body of work? Do you think there's any kind of embedded commentary or do they, or do they sit in isolation? Can you uh, comment on that? No, you have like uh, lots of same themes that are coming back uh, all the time, you know, like uh, I guess you know, like we, we are like in a world that is hyper saturated with uh, with technological things. You know, like the look the way we're speaking. We're speaking through a network that is spanning worldwide. I'm all pixelated on the, the, the screen over there. It's a very spooky feeling. It's like being half present and not. Um, <laughs> And I think Between it's interesting we can't to, see the thousands of people sitting in front of us. <laughs> I don't see They're all smiling, people. nodding, encouraging us. Uh, but I think it's a. But and you see the, that kind of technology since like digital, the, the digital concept appeared, has been very, very, very fast transform into or digitalize, and the digitalize is an incredibly efficient process, beautiful, but it also means that it's total equivalency between anything, between the sound and an image is the same thing, between like, a, you, you can codify with that process absolutely anything, and I think it's quite interesting to, you know, like oppose that very constructed cold materiality of the technology with like things that are much more human and see how how you can if you if you like a lot of it is commentary about the technology itself. Mm. You know, if uh, if you look back at the the origin of of technology, it's uh, it's uh, the the old Greek god Hermes Trismegistus is the god of uh, the thieves, is the god of the crossroad, is the god of you know like the first technological item described in mythology is uh, the lira, because he nicked all the cattle from Apollo, so it's like it's kind of a, a, a present that you know make forget all, all that bad thing, um, so. You know, this is a German philosopher called Peter Sloterdijk that always talk about kind of allot technology. How can you create a technology that is working with nature as opposed to against, which is the, the origin of it? We are interested by all that, those kind of things and creating a materiality that's speaking to humans. Paul, I think you... Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, and I think... Um, and. I think that, uh, and perhaps you can make a comment on this, is that the, the connection, or being, for people being able to make a connection with your work, is this idea of the reappropriating and I guess reusing these um, sort of noble materials that we're kind of all familiar with, and it makes us, I guess, a little bit easier to make a connection with the work. Is that is that something you can make a comment on? Yeah, I, I, I guess you know it's a it's a form of empowerment, it's a form of. Uh, you know, like being able to to modify your environment, you know? At least he assess the possibility. Mm -hmm. So, Sebastian and Connie, now, now that you are being swept off your feet by people coming to you, whether they be uh, design brands 
or um, galleries, commissioners of, of all sorts, they're coming to you for your special brand of thinking, of making. Um, they're coming to you for your work. Have, uh, can you share with us, have you had somebody approach you of late that presents you with a real dilemma, perhaps uh, that might challenge your uh, design process, or perhaps you've been presented with something that's not really technology at all. Have you been asked to design a chair or something that uh, you seriously have to stop and, and reevaluate your process and your materials that you've become um, at home, home with? I guess it happens all the time. It happens all the time. I mean, especially if you if you work in in um, and we do work in a public context. We've had people coming to us saying, "Oh, we love your work, and we would love to commission you for a piece." But can you not use technology because it means we need to think about complicated maintenance afterwards? And uh, the answer from us is well. This is not how we work. Our work is is can use technology if uh, within this context we feel that um, it's not essential. Then uh, we will react to it without using technology. But um, it's it's an interesting one. So you're obviously faced with these things. And that's where gallery work is fantastic because you're completely free of any discussions like that because, uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely free to experiment. You don't have to comply to any fire regulations or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, so it's a question we constantly have to confront, but I think we're finding our way quite well through it. And it's an interesting debate as well for us because um, especially in regards to the arts world and uh, digital art emerging more and more, questions of um, how do we actually maintain, preserve, archive these pieces. And it's an interesting debate that's being uh, held at the moment where some people believe um, well, you need to take care of a painting as much as you need to take care of a digital work and that we cannot expect for a digital work to last forever, um, that it comes with its own set of, of uh, yeah, restrictions. Um, and other people, they're, yeah, they're sort of planning that in while making the work, wondering whether their, their piece is going to expire in 10 years' time because uh, it doesn't use the right type of computer or hardware. Has there ever been an example, um, Connie, yes, has there ever been so an example when you've been given a brief that you thought was not right and that constraint has actually turned out to be a positive thing. Have you ever had um, a project that perhaps didn't look very promising, but actually has delivered beyond? Uh, failure, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yes. we want to hear oh, if you've had a failure. A massive failure. <laughs> of course, if you're trying to, to do uh, something that no, you know, nobody has done before, that you're prone to fail, but fail is a failing is a very good thing. You know, like uh, you, you need to allow yourself to fail faster, basically, <laughs> so you can come back with like uh, something that does work at the end, which is what is important. But yes, of course, you do, you you shift things like constantly. You have to like we, we started the project, which I, I can't really talk about now in detail. But we started with like uh, an assumption of doing like a certain type of sculpture, and we tried with a prototype, and it was a catastrophe. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like it nearly killed everybody in the studio. It was, yeah. uh, uh, and, and, and you have to think, okay, what, what, what's going on? Why is it not possible? And, but that's, that's, that's another thing that I think is very, very interesting. It's like, uh, again, two different worlds, two different mentalities. Um, if you compare like an engineer with like a, a, a more creative person, like a designer or an artist, we, we employ a lot of engineers here as well. And if you look at the thought process, it's very interesting because if you, you know, ask an engineer to develop something, you tell him like, I want Z, and he's gonna go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, until he reaches Z. And if you reach an obstacle, he's gonna hit harder. 
uh, now this is going to go around most of the time because it doesn't have the capacity of doing that. But if you compare those two thinking, yes, you do massive failure, but you also can very rapidly learn from that. And I think like, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's like how to fail fast rather <laughs> than if to fail or not. And I'd like to bring Phoebe in now with a few questions, if I can. Phoebe, do you have any tweets that have come through? There's um, one or two. <laughs> Sorry, I have to um, try and find a way of wording wording them into questions because they're more comments. <laughs> um, but this idea of immersion um, has come up and... You, you spoke about, and I'm just going to relate it to something that you said earlier, there's this kind of simplicity of output within your work and observing some of it from your website and um, some of the film pieces that were on Vimeo, I can see that there's this um, kind of reductive quality to the surfaces and the kind of mechanics that you're working within the complexity um, of the technologies that you, you um, use. And so this question of how you perhaps see immersion now maybe shifting in from what it's conventionally known as to now perhaps something um, beyond the excess of, of space and it's now about um, the senses being more sensitive to, this, to the kind of simplicity of space. Does that make sense? Um, we didn't hear the last... We didn't really oh, hear did very hear? well the last part of the sentence. It makes it very, very difficult to answer. My, can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. So the question essentially is um, the idea of immersion. Do you find that perhaps has changed from its conventional kind of um, meaning um, in terms of the excess of spatial awareness and sensation to um, your works, which are essentially um, incredibly um, complex, yet have a simplicity to them. How do you see the role of immersion within your work, or do you see the role of immersion within your work? The role, the role of immersion. Yes. That... Immersiveness. The immersiveness aspect of it. Um, I think it's a, again, it's a, it's a, it, to, to me, it's a, it's a tool to, to an end. It's a mean. But you know, like if you look at it, you know, like your aspect of immersion, it, uh, for example, there's a lot of people that uh, classify us into kind of interactive corner of media art. And if you look, we nearly have no interactive thing at all. Um, I think it's a tool. I think you can uh, achieve immersion in loads of different ways. You know, like for example, I don't know if you've ever heard like uh, um, binaural recordings. You know, Janet Cardiff, like Canadian artist, does, does uh, extensive use of that. It's absolutely fascinating. It immerses your, yourself without the space. So the spatial component, I don't think it's uh, uh, a necessary um, component of it. I think it's, uh, we, we, we like to use it. It's much more like a, a choice. And as regard to the, the simplicity, yes, we use a lot of, uh, we simplify a lot of things. We have a very uh, kind of, uh, Reductionist, I can't say minimalist because we have like thousands of pieces, but it's a definitely a reductionist approach to things. But I think that's uh, more some, something that is to do with uh, the, the purity, a kind of purity. Um, I have to tell you, Sebastian, there's a slight giggling in the audience because there's someone in your studio behind you who's looking very tired, <laughs> sitting right behind you, kind of rubbing their temples. <laughs> So, so we've all been a wee bit distracted. You've obviously been uh, working him hard. Um, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> From Australia. <laughs> Look, we only have um, 10 minutes left, so I'm hoping we might have some audience questions that they can put directly to uh, Connie and Sebastian. Is there anybody, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Burning question? While you're all thinking, I've got one. Yeah. Um, Sebastian and Connie, I've read um, somewhere, and this sort of relates to this idea of failure, but I read um, uh, somewhere that a nice quote that you had around risk, and I've got this um, designer friend who, she's fantastic, she says, she always knows that a project is working really well when she thinks she's going to throw up. 
But this is how she gauges that when she's moving into the unknown, um, if, you know, unless she really feels like she's pushing where she's been before, she's pushing herself. She knows that she's, you know, only any, only heading into familiar territory, and that's really not an exciting place to go. And I, I liked this thing that I read um, that you had said that risk was a really positive thing. Can you talk a little bit about the aspect of risk at Troika? Uh, what do you mean in terms of risk in the developing sense or risk yeah, in, 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 in all senses? Whether it's pushing clients, pushing yourselves. Well, uh, I, uh, very. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Peter and you'll know. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say, um, yeah, there is the high risk factor, but I think uh, that's what we enjoy about it. And yeah, both in terms of developing, but also in terms of how might people perceive your piece. Uh, will we still like at the end what we, we, we thought the piece would do or would, would be like in the end? Uh, yeah, so there is a very... Uh, yeah, there is uh, high risk attached to it, but, but I think not, that's part of our... Yeah, but it's not like, uh, I mean, like, uh, how do you define risk? You know, yeah, like, yeah. this is like the, the old discussion when we were uh, doing, like, the Expo Pavilion project. With, um, we had to work a lot, like, the, the, the English government, and of course, for them, like, risk is, like, the, the, I mean, you mention risk, and the, the, the everybody become blue. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, Sebastian, you don't want to use the word risk around a client very much. That makes them very nervous. Yes, no, no, but it's not us mentioning risk. It's like people like perceiving it as risky because we're saying like, uh, yeah, we're gonna do, we're gonna find a technique to grow more vertically on the wall. Has it been done before? No. How are you gonna do that? Well, we opened three greenhouses already. Uh, one in Shanghai, two in Chichester. What about that? It's about how you you manage the risk. Um, pragmatically, I mean, it's risky to put a bulb into the ceiling. You know, it's not risky if you know that you're using the right fitting and the right screw. So, like, risk is a, uh, it's a something that uh, I kind of abhor in, uh, in, in its uh, definition, like in the modern definition, or like the, the definition post-1970 where, like, everything become like a, a tar- risk become like you, you need to be risk adverse, you know. Why? Why is that? Everything we've always done as human beings has always been bloody risky, you know. It's, 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 I'm not with a spear. It's risky to cross the road. Everything is risky. If you don't want risk, you don't want life. But how do you manage that risk? It's like, it's not about like, we're not completely stupid. We're not, you know, like um, proposing to do dangerous thing or, or things that are like obviously out of, you know, budget or timeline or things like that. How do you manage the risk is interesting. It's the same thing with like what Connie was mentioning. People like uh, commissioning like uh, uh, digital pieces and, um, you know, like, uh, worrying about the maintenance. Well, don't worry about the maintenance. Just think about it clearly. Think what you need to do. Think how you can facilitate that. Think of it as a, as a part of the of, of the necessary thing that enabled the piece in the first place. But that's, you know, that's... Uh, that's my answer to risk. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We're trying to draw some passion out of you. <laughs> uh, Phoebe's got some more questions on her tweet. Um, there's a question here about how um, you deal with time constraints of a commissioned work, so having to produce work within a specific time frame. Can you comment on that? Uh, we work more. <laughs> Longer. Oh, it's, uh, we, we usually, um, and now... Clients will often have heard about it, but we usually allow quite a large chunk of time in the beginning of a project that we call R&D, which uh, is our research uh, um, period, where and that usually ends up with a prototype. And that, I guess, is quite unusual that clients give you that freedom of actually researching and developing an idea without really knowing that it's going to work and just to promise that it's going to work. But then it's about reassuring them uh, through yeah, quite a methodic way of saying, okay, after one month you will see the first prototype, after the second month you'll see the second one. and. Uh, 
yeah, this is usually how we work. And explaining or opening the dialogue with really explaining how we work and inviting them to the studio, showing them previous projects. Um, it's the same thing then, risk, in a way. Um, you know, like, it's like, how do you manage those, those parameters? Risk, time constraint, the budget. You develop methods that are uh, adapted to what you're doing and that you, if you confront them with intelligence, you find methods that are lowering considerably the trouble you have with that. And we're still not 100%. On risk, we're okay. Budget, we're okay. Time, we're still quite bad. In a way, that we are working a lot. But, I think we're kind but of. But it's getting better, better. Um, we're almost coming to the end of the session, so I guess um, perhaps it might be a really nice note to, to end on if we could get a sense of a project um, that you're working on now that really excites you and, and perhaps that you can reflect on um, how it connects back through the body of your work. Is there something you can tell us about that it's not too top secret that we can kind of um, feel, I guess, part of your journey from the beginning to the end? Yeah, at the moment we're developing like a, a also a lot of smaller pieces uh, because we want to. It's something that we've put aside for a while that is like working more with gallery and uh, in like more in exhibition context. We've concentrated like on very large scale thing. Uh, we still do that. Most of those large scale projects, unfortunately, I can't talk about. <laughs> but the smaller one that we, you know, like we we start to work on, you know, like more like. Try to go again with like a, a, a gallery and smaller pieces as well because I think there's a very interesting link to be done between like larger work and smaller work. They, they are different contexts, they work completely differently. One is heavily funded, very long term. Uh, you know, like you have to work with a lot of people, you have to solve a lot of, you know, health and safety problem, risk management stuff. Whereas like in the small, smaller scale work, you're much freer, it's much smaller, it's much faster. But so I think like the both of them could like work very, very well. And that's why we're trying to find this balance between the, the, the large and the small. The reception is also very different. Uh, for instance, with the cloud in Heathrow, it's been up there now for three years. Mm -hmm four years, three, four years, and we kind of get a sense that people like it through, let's say, it has been published in magazines, but we don't really get um, an immediate feedback from the people that actually experience it. And only until very recently where we discovered there was some kind of airport blog where people would tweet and blog about the cloud and uh, check when it was cleaned and when it was off was on, uh, we realized, oh yes, okay, there is a this side to it, obviously, of thousands of people passing this piece every day and experiencing it. And if you create a piece for a gallery, that becomes very different. Um, how you have an immediate feedback of how people perceive it, and also through, let's say, if it's a group show, um, your piece is being exhibited next to other artists or designers, it puts it in, for us into a very interesting context because very often we're surprised about, um, let's say, our work being displayed to another work that we would have not necessarily related to our practice. And that is really informing. Um, and very interesting from a curatorial point of view how people yeah, perceive it and how they, they experience your work and what they see in it. So it's an interesting testing ground for very different reasons, both the public arena but also the, the, the gallery arena. So we, as Seb said, we've been working a lot in the public context but would like to build at the moment a bit more on, on that smaller scale white box context, so to speak. Um, yes, there, there are. Um, this, I guess, connects a little bit with what you were just saying, this idea of being positioned. Who, who are your precedents or your inspirations? How do you see yourself? Who do you align yourself with in terms of contemporary or historical um, practitioners who you draw upon? 
difficult. Lining is very difficult. I think like uh, nobody like uh, with uh, 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 the, the necessary ego that pushes you into doing those kind of work uh, without denying it, uh, you, you would not align yourself with. Uh, you can cite references, um, but we have like very many of them. Um, We're really. Um, it's very difficult to, to answer that question for me. Um, if you look on that side of the world, there is about like a thousand five hundred books. Uh, it's only on art and design and things like that, and uh, and also like things that are completely different. We have like the UN report on habitat two thousand and five. There we have. Uh, so it's very difficult to tell you like uh, yes, we really would like to be that kind of artist or that kind of designer. Uh, well, what I can say is that our practice, as Seb mentioned before, is based a lot on cooperation. And I must say, the, the biggest inspiration I, I, I gained from the people we met and, and worked with, and they might have not necessarily done anything remotely like what we do. Uh, for instance, we worked with a guy called Michael Polin uh, on the Expo project, who was a sustainability advisor uh, for architects. And he's making this crazy project in uh, Libya and southern Spain where he uh, builds, yeah, he built structures where he catches um, essentially fog and clouds uh, from the Mediterranean, um, collects the water and managed to green the desert in the north of Libya, uh, looking at the ent uh, entire inefficient system of Libya pumping water from the south of the country to the north. And, and uh, just somebody like that I find hugely inspiring. And also uh, we read a lot, I just uh, read a book an optimist uh, tour of the future by a guy called Mark Stevenson and uh, he is looking at lots of current developments in technology and not looking at doomsday but what how can we actually interact with it responsibly and what yeah these 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 kind of things are inspiring our work that might be an encounter with a biologist or that might be a novel we read or a Tarkovsky film watch it's um, well it sounds yeah. sounds Connie very apt that your influences are as diverse and rich as as the work you produce um, I think we've we've run out of time but we'd like to to thank you both Sebastian and Connie for for being so generous um, with your answers and your your responses and and revealing uh, to us a little insight into how your office works we're, we're really grateful and we hope um, perhaps you'll you'll come and visit us one day um, so thank you and we'll say good night here and uh, well, see you sometime you. we hope Um, I'm going to kick off with a question for Paul, if I can. Um, so, Paul, I'm kind of interested in what you thought about the technology nature thing seemed to be an aspect that you picked up on very strongly. Do you have any reflections about um, their responses there and, and things that you, you pulled out of interest? I just think, I, I think personally, I think it's also when I was talking about, I guess, um, using the, not only re referencing nature, but also using perhaps um, those noble materials or materials that we're already familiar with, it, it, it makes it a, a perhaps a little easier for us to um, make a connection with their work and to engage with their work. And I think particularly when you're using technology, you know, it, 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 it can sometimes feel a little bit, um, you know, dehumanised in a sense. And I think that that's perhaps the way that they humanise their work is by using materials that we're already familiar with. So we're not, we're sort of not asked to engage with a new, a whole new concept. Um, and also just to reference nature, I think that we, we, we already feel this kind of connection or this sort of emotive attachment to it, I think. And, yeah. And can you read nature very strongly in their work, or is it an association that you immediately make when you see their work, or is it? I mean, I think, I think some of it. I think some of it is, you know, there's an obvious um, reflection. Um, oh, sorry, you know, an obvious interpretation of nature. Uh, I think some of their work, like light rain, um, even cloud, in a sense, that, that that sort of organic nature of the animation, and I, I, I don't know what that. Uh, 
the fish one that they were referring to. I said out the back that I wouldn't call it the fish one, but <laughs> I don't know what it's called. We know so what I but yeah, I think those things are a direct reference or, or a d direct interpretation of the way that um, you know nature um, moves or, or or works, and certainly the sense of repetition, you know, which we see so much in nature as well. I think is is, is definitely evident in a lot of their work. Well, Zhu, I'm interested in your reflections on the interview, um, particularly having been down there and now come up to join us up here on the panel. Was there something um, out of those five points or beyond that you particularly um, found engaging? Uh, yes, there are a couple of points, but um, maybe I'll start with the technology issue. To me, actually, technology is not an interesting thing at all itself. Because, you know, look around where you are right now. There is nothing that's in, not involved with technology. We, we live in technological world. Um, so use of what technology is not interest of, interesting to me. But what's interesting is that how you use it one, in what context. So, um, for example, in, in, in terms of cooking, no one asks what kind of knife you use to cook pasta. No one asks what kind of gas oven you used. Um, it is the pasta that you eat the main, is the main focus. And somehow in, in their work, the ingredients, of, um, ingredients that they used are perfectly well portioned and perfectly well cooked mm -hmm. to taste. That's how I find uh, the technology aspect in their work. But what fascinated me was actually one uh, sentence um, was talked, design as a service. Uh, that struck my, my mind. Um, and she also added that traditionally and the current practice, design was perce has been perceived as a service. Mm -hmm. Now. I think it's really important to think about that because it's perhaps the time to change if we are thinking about um, sustaining our life and uh, considering sustainment, um, the, the measurement um, of progress, measurement of productivity, measurement of uh, uh, good design, measurement of happiness has to change. Um, so in a way, we have been dri driving us as an object maker, um, producer of um, products. Because um, I think the f too much focus on object itself and product itself will drive us uh, into the, the cliff. Mm. And, um, and the, hence, um, the experiential quality that they talk about and they embed in their work becomes the most interesting and important uh, aspect. Um, if we think about experience first, beforehand, you uh, make a object with whatever material that it is, it is more, uh, I think that will help us to focus on the quality of life and change of the quality than um, adding to a consumption. Mm. I think that's an incredibly salient point in, and, it, and we can drive it out to architecture too mm. in which they engage. If we, if, we, if we view it as a service industry, if we view it as purely a commercial pursuit mm. rather than a deeply embedded cultural pursuit, we, we risk and, in, and certainly in this country, we, I think it's 1.2% of all Australian homes are designed by an architect, a tiny, tiny proportion. Mm -hmm. And the same can be said with this kind of um, focus on... Obviously, there's, there's great um, discussion at the moment about manufacturing in Australia and how we support what is essentially a very difficult industry here in our context. I think also, while we're addressing those issues, how do we make architecture and design meaningful to people on the ground within our culture? We also need to make sure that as designers and architects, that we are investing in a cultural discussion, mm -hmm. that we're investing in writing, talking, exhibiting, and communicating our work beyond the end result. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, 
that's, that's vital. Does anyone have anything to I add to that? Um, Guangzhou, what I found very interesting about talking to Sebastian was um, the almost the relationship to the gallery as being the uh, perfect or ideal receptor for the work. And um, I guess if I look at the work of Olive Ellison, even early studio Van Lai Shout, I see a very similar pattern where the gallery or that rarefied commission is ideal placement for the work. But sooner or later, the boredom and the rhetoric of the gallery sets in and we realise that, or we return to our roots as designers and the desire to connect and to engage in um, social ritual, in cultural awakening, the ability to, to connect in the company of the market it st starts to surface. And so, um, and I don't, and I don't mean to be cynical here, but but I can't help but think that uh, the conversations that that Troika is having at the moment will get to a point where they have to move beyond the gallery, in a sense, to reinvent or reposition, replace themselves to be relevant. Because I'm, I do believe that that serial production and mass production can be embedded with cultural imperatives. And I think to suggest that only culture making or, or cultural storage, if you like, can occur in those sort of sanctified spaces where we're told to look, to look for the message and to, to extract the meaning. You know, we, we, uh, manufacturing does become impoverished mm. and you just you go through what I've just gone through five days down at the convention centre and you think, hang on, at some point these conversations that we're having about design uh, do need to have the capacity to traverse these spaces. So at, at one hand, while I can understand the, the, the falling off the cliff, and I agree with you, there's a part of me that really, really wants that, uh, that, uh, that poetry, that, uh, that, that sort of cultural substance to, to move beyond the gallery and to end up in a product that, um, you know, we can all purchase down the road <laughs> or on the, on the internet if we want. I wonder, though, if it is site-specific in that way or program-specific. I mean, it seems to me that we're talking about one kind of gallery conditioned, a very rarefied mm. gallery conditioned, the way that perhaps we might look at... We could even take that outside the gallery to something like a Serpentine Pavilion, which is a very expensive showcase for what architecture can be. Mm. I'm more interested in ideas, and I think that mm. they can traverse a gallery environment and also a trade show. Mm -hmm. and, and it's how those ideas are communicated and I think they have a place regardless of that context that they can exist mm. pretty much anywhere and speak to people with a really strong narrative. So mm -hmm. um, I think you're right though, the way that some of that work is referred to is in a very particular gallery environment where it is rarefied and that allows a certain freedom. But I think that a good idea can exist without those kind of rarefied constraints, both in a gallery and both in a much more commercial environment. Um, perhaps I think um, by existing in that or by having, I guess, the art space as the end space for their product to exist or the, whatever it is for it to exist is that opportunity for it to be a little bit more free and a little bit more experimental and perhaps that's those areas of play where they get to exercise a little more in the studio. So I think it's probably really important that they have the exhibition as an end product as well as perhaps having these commission projects going as well. So... I don't. I, I mean, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I imagine that there's a, a, a healthy balance that sort of mm. exists. But it's curious. I often, I often are amused to the way that designers will speak about the gallery and the way that 
you know, sort of uh, people who are trained through the, the, the paradigm of the contemporary arts talk about the gallery. They talk about the gallery differently. Designers will often talk about the gallery as being a space where you can present experimental production, um, you can test out ideas. But for the contemporary artist, it is the penultimate. It's where you launch and present your genius. And so I'm not what why I'm curious about Troika is that they do have a, like you said, it's well cooked. It's beautifully executed. Um, uh, is, it, is it saying very much? Um, I don't know, because when I interrogate it like I would a piece of, uh, uh, you know, sort of, hi, I'm a bit of art over here, it, it's, I have more, um, I have, uh, uh, that there's more history and, and, and there's more rhetoric which I can apply through which to read it. But Troika's work sits in this curious kind of um, uh, very um, polished, extremely well produced uh, uh, public art um, or installation uh, work that's ending up in the gallery. And uh, what I found interesting when they were talking about, you know, they're producing smaller works. Well, I think yes, because in places like London, there's a very mature, collectible market for one-off and limited edition design, which we don't see here. So I can understand their leap beautifully, and it's about the market. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, their relationship to the gallery, I don't think is as, as critical as uh, as um, perhaps uh, other creatives may, you know, position themselves in relationship to that space. I think it's interesting you should raise that whole kind of notion of the designer in the gallery. I think it kind of connects back with um, something Sebastian said, which was that this is a new area. Mm -hmm. I mean, art has a very long lineage of. Um, historic discourse about the practice and then showing it in a gallery context and, and much like you say as being the penultimate. Um, whereas design is, this is a really new testing ground and I think um, while there is a sense of it being objectified and fetishised in that environment, mm -hmm. there's also a really important kind of um, testing ground that they're trying to unravel in terms of they're not really looking at technology in that sense of fetishising it from a contemporary point of view. They're actually driving it back through history and trying to understand it and, and then kind of recontextualising it. So I find that interesting, although the end result is, mm. is obviously quite... Um, I, I understand what you're saying, Fleur, but I think if they were really doing that, they'd do it in a really Vito Conti way, that it'd be messier, it'd be grittier, it would be a bit kind of um, more provocative. I don't I don't find anything provocative about Troika's work at all. I find it sublime. I start thinking of Kant. I, I start thinking of, you know, um, uh, aesthetics as, a, as the philosophical study of experience. I start thinking of phenomena and nature. So if, if anything, there's this desire to emulate the most profound experience that we can have through their smarts because uh, the, the Troika studio, as, as Sebastian said, you know, if we were all artists, we'd be going around in circles. I mean, they have extraordinary capacity and capability within that studio, um, which means uh, they can deliver what they can deliver. And I think, you know, if, if, if we had that capacity within our operations, you know, it, we'd be, uh, it'd be very exciting. It's... I think um, if, if we frame their practice as being essentially a, 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 a UK, very European sort of framed practice, um, I think it is quite um, atypical of what we're seeing at the moment with interdisciplinary design studios. It's, it's, it's a product of the time. And um, and I think their prerogative is to produce beautiful work, drove uh, our work that is genuinely teasing out contemporary issues about practice.
practice and creativity and and what design can be in a gallery space. But I, I, I wonder how, <laughs> you know, I mean, we talk of it from afar and not really experiencing it, and I wonder how, how emotive it is. Like, you know, it, they're pretty immersive, I think. Well, I imagine they would be. All I've seen is a couple of videos, so it's very difficult for me to be able to assess whether or not, you know, there's some sort of emotional attachment to it. And I think if we're moved in that way, then by all means it can be defined as art, you know, if it's some sort of... It, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I, do, I think it's pretty hard to assess unless we see their work in a space, in a gallery or, in, or an exhibition in an environment like that, whether this sort of motion that happens... I mean, I don't even know whether the cloud is... I mean, the cloud's uh, a commission piece, but whether that's randomised or whether there is some sort of configuration to create some sort of emotional response from those who go by, I'm not 100% sure. So, mm. I, I mean, I don't understand the complexities or the levels of, in, in which the way things animate within their, their space and the movement. So I just wonder whether, you know, that changes your perspective of the work if you're to actually experience it in it's the space. It's a general dilemma, isn't it? Often mm. trying to judge things via image which we, or, you know, experience things without experiencing them. But, mm. um, Phoebe, I'd like to kind of ask you about your ideas in terms of the work was often described as immersive mm. and I know this is an area of interest that, that you're particularly engaged with mm. and then perhaps we might throw to the floor because I'm sure some of you have some burning questions but maybe if you could um, talk about that aspect a little bit further. Yeah I guess um, just again my only access to um, their work was through um, films on Vimeo and so this idea of immersion I thought was quite um, intriguing in that, yeah, it was all about imagining how one um, would experience it within the actual piece itself and, and I guess the role of documentation and what that plays now within pieces. And for some reason, I, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of Spiral Jetty um, by Smithson and the idea that this, this piece has been um, disappearing and, and has now returned and, and one of the main ways of accessing it is this kind of... Um, Doc, through the documentation and that the role of documentation actually becomes this this key role, becomes the work in itself or it's an expansion from the original piece to now this um, this other type of work and I mean you can relate it back to this idea of site and non-site and so forth but I'm interested in, in their, in how they document the qualities of their work and I guess the immersive Ness, which I was quite vocal about when we met a few weeks ago, um, and it's something I'm still kind of grappling with myself because this idea of, if, you know, I guess the traditional idea of immersiveness, my understanding was it's something about excess, something where your senses are so completely kind of um, thrown and you lose all sense of yourself within the work, and yet I find their work so completely um, revealed in that moment. You see the mechanisms, you see the kinetics, you kind of see... Um, the revelation of what makes the dappled light, I'm thinking of that piece, mm -hmm. rain I think it's called, and, and so there's this kind of ephemeral quality but then there's also with this, this tension where you actually, you see what makes it. And so it's a little bit different to someone like Eliasson for instance who kind of doesn't reveal the mechanics behind and it is this immersive yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, experience and, um, and I guess I'm fortunate enough to have been in one of those so I see it but also the way it's documented you see just what you kind of imagine, well, yeah. what what you experience, yeah. and so just the role of, you know, Vimeo, for instance, or their website. I found that just because here we are researching them and having to kind of critique the work and not actually experience it, and yet it's described as all these kind of things, and yet I find that interesting now that it hasn't been considered maybe to that next role, how people come to access it and does it become this kind of um, secondary way of experiencing the work. I think Troy can make artefacts. Alexson yeah. does not. Yeah. You know, he, d he delivers uh, ex things for you to experience where you're often wondering um, how it's been authored, how, how, has, how has it appeared. Mm. Um, but I think Troy can make, make, make artefacts, mm. uh, artefacts that, that ev have the capacity to, to evoke yep. emotion within us. Mm. And they're successful because we recognise in their patterns things that we see elsewhere. Mm. And, uh, and many of those patterns we recognise 
you know, in phenomena. Mm. Maybe that's a really good note to open it to the floor. Uh, is it artefact? And, and if it is artefact, what happens in capturing, as Phoebe has described, um, the ephemeral nature of these works? Um, does anyone have a, a question? It doesn't have to be about the, that issue. It can be about any issue um, that might have been raised tonight. Yes, why, please. Why are we calling Go to the a very simple question. Um, why are we calling them designers, not artists? Well, that, that was a, um, a question that came up and we spent quite a lot of time <laughs> sitting around the table. Um, it, and it's a difficult one. I think at, I, I, my personal view is that it comes out of their training and their they are embedded and, um, and connected with a discourse in design. That is what they are they're interested in discussing and they position themselves as designers. Is that a sleight of hand? Is that a sleight of hand? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think they are designers and they are using various kind of um, techniques to unfold their design practice and to um, relate their ideas. I guess there's a, a kind of question of um, I could use the example of Dun and Raby, who are colleagues of theirs at the RCA, who don't make any products. They don't have things at all, but they state very clearly that they are designers, not artists. It's a long discussion. Um, and, um, I don't know, does anyone else have anything well, to add really to that? Who really cares what, what they are called? And actually, d during the interview, they mentioned that there, it's not necessary to draw a line between artists and designers. Mm. So it's a name, it's just for, uh, it's a name that you want to put on your business card perhaps, on your website, but otherwise uh, it's not important, I don't think. And maybe there's no point of discussion at mm. all. Mm. <laughs> well, there's changes in critical discourse. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Especially if you're asked to critique the work, which is the trouble I have. Yeah. So if I'm critiquing the work with my art hat on, I will critique it very differently when I've got my design hat on. And I'm constantly got to have the conversation between. And perhaps, I mean, I've always been drawn to that slippery work that appears between disciplines or happens between, um, uh, you know, codes or, 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 or practice. So how do we speak of this strange stuff? You know, um, it happens in, uh, amongst other disciplines, mm. and we've uh, managed to speak about it. But I think, um, you know, uh, the, the last century we've spent just so much energy trying to create the distinguish, you know, the distinguishing features between the two. Then when, when we see this stuff that we're attracted to, we go, oh, hang on, how do we speak of it? And and so, you know, it's, a, it's as much about learning how to speak about this type of practice or at or production, I think. But how, how, how important is, is it to analyse somebody's work and try to understand what they what they wanted to do. I wonder, I mean, I, it doesn't, I don't mean to disrespect those who, you know, uh, uh, professionally critique artwork or designers and whatever, but um, I guess what we should be interested in is that how they inspired us to think about um, a matter right here, right now, within our context. So I don't really care what they thought of it, what their intention was, and I don't have I'm not the slightest interest. I don't have a slightest interest analyzing uh, what they mean and, and how they achieved that. I think I may be more interested in practical uh, issues, but I guess the point that they talked about um, several things. How do we interpret um, for uh, to our context, and how do we use it? Um, I, I think that's because when we look at a, a piece of art, it's all about extracting its value. It's all mm. about asking, well, what value is this work? And, and, and so I think the mere fact that their work now is in the gallery, there, there is behavioural, you know, modalities around galleries. You look at work and you, are, you ask yourself, what, what, where is the value in this work? So if they don't wish for us to critique or to look at the work in that way, they have to work harder at positioning it or placing it elsewhere. And, um, you know, 
the, curiously, you know, um, uh, a lot of the installation work that they're doing is is funded, com, you know, commissioned and supported by big design brands. You know, the Swarovskis of the world, um, uh, you know, identify and align themselves with other brands and at the moment creative brands, whether it be the design, the young groovy design studio or whether it be the mature, you know, uh, artist. Um, and, and so they're, they're practising in that, in that world at the moment too. And so that can't help but um, affect the, the, the work in, su in some way. We're going to, we've got about two minutes left, so I just want to see if anyone else has a, a question or would like to respond to someone. Yeah, I think one thing to, to consider too is that those brands that you're talking about, they're, they're actually strategically trying to um, align themselves with the vanguard and they're trying to, to very much put themselves on a very experimental front. Um, these, these designers are obviously a, a perfect case in point, but um, I absolutely agree with everything you've said so far that, that we can't over-intellectualize and analyze this um, without maybe having precedent for you know, this type of critical discourse. But the gray area does exist between design and art. Um, I think they, they are very much artists and should be valued on, on an artistic level. When you talk about you know, how do you assess the value in, in a work of, of theirs, um, there's obviously a lot of effort and, and thought and creativity that's gone into this work. So just as much as we might appreciate a, a work of abstract art that might be just oil paint on canvas that really has no, that may challenge me to kind of come to terms with what they're conceptually trying to communicate, um, you still, at least the art world that you know, definitely appreciates abstract art, um, slaps that value right on it and it goes to market and, and it can do or may not do that well. But regardless of that, I think that, that what we're looking at is, is a gray area that um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily call a movement quite yet. But that said, um, when we're trying to um, you know, basically come to this critical discourse of, of what this is or what this might be, um, you have to also consider the fact that every art movement in the past, whether we consider the last century or you know, the last you know, three centuries, um, that we didn't really know how to make sense of it. And, and especially the, 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 the populace didn't really um, care to make sense of it at first. You know? So um, that's one thing to consider, I think. And, and um, yeah, this is just the very beginning of, of basically them playing with uh, different sorts of, of materials that um, are just enabling them to to create on a completely different and new wave that we we're, we're just becoming familiar with and and uh, in terms of appreciating it, I think we're all here because we we do appreciate it um, for what it is and and we are curious to find out more about it. So um, yeah. Is there another question from the floor? Well, at this point. I think it's really interesting that we're having this discussion and that it's um, a part of um, the design festival. I think it's really um, critical that we're looking at the overlap and the interlinking and the amalgamation of creative thinking, be it um, architecture, be it art, be it craft. And I think you know everything that's been said is really um, indicative of, an, a, to me, it's kind of like a new movement, this overlapping of creativity in a variety of forms that is really exciting. Um, and it's great that we have the opportunity to um, look at it internationally and nationally as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, perhaps that's not a bad comment. I'm getting the nod from the front. I think you summed up very nicely for us. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about there in terms of design is it art. What is it in a gallery context? Does it, is it about value? Is it about reflection on practice? So many issues there. So perhaps you can jump onto the State of Design blog and uh, post some comments. Thank you very much.